you've parked your car and you're walking to your house. You see a slight movement off to your right out of the corner of your eye. Don't know what it was? We'll take a listen to these stories and they just might give you an idea. I'm Carol Ann and welcome to The In-Between where we tell stories of the strange and mysterious. With that being said, let's get to the stories. Back in high school, Bo and his girlfriend, Anne, live really close to each other, about a five-minute drive away, less if they speed. Without going into too many details, they're your typical teenage couple, hanging out on the weekend, cuddling under a blanket, and watching movies. They are in love and barely take their attention off each other long enough to even figure out the plot of the movie. And this night isn't any different. They're watching Pirates of the Caribbean and I use the term watching lightly, and Bo wants to stay. But he has to get moving if he's going to make it home by curfew, which is midnight. Anne is glued to his chest, begging him to stay just a little longer, when Buffy, the family's dog, starts to go nuts outside. Buffy's just a tiny thing, the kind of dog that Bo's grandpa would say is more of a rat than a hound, but a good guard dog nonetheless. Buffy is yipping around the back sliding glass door, throwing in a vicious snarl every so often just for good measure. Bo gets up and walks over to the door to let her in when he catches movement in the backyard. Now, Anne's backyard is wall-to-wall garden, so it's basically covered in greenery. As he slides open the door for Buffy, he catches the leaves rustling on some of the bushes. Odd, considering there's no wind that night. He ushers in the dog, slides the door shut, locks it, and pulls the blinds closed. Suddenly, Anne says, hey, Bo, unlock the door. My sister's still outside. Bo says, what? No, she's not. Anne says, I just saw her go to the tool shed. So Bo pulls Anne to her feet and says, follow me. I will show you. As he turns his phone flashlight on. They open the sliding glass door, head down the deck steps, and walk over to the family shed, just so he can prove she is wrong. No one is there. Just that creepy shed sitting alone in the alleyway between their house and their neighbors. They walk back inside, and Anne is a bit perturbed at Bo while he gloats at his victory. He kisses her on the forehead and tells her it's time that he goes home before he gets grounded for getting back too late. As usual... She protests even more, saying, "You that never enforces your curfew. Just stay a little longer, please. But Bo insists that he needs to be home on time. He slides his shoes on and starts for the front door, their hands interlocked like the high school sweethearts that they are. Anne walks Bo to his car, where they talk and stuff for a bit longer before saying their goodbyes. Once Anne is safely back inside, Bo gets in his car and looks down briefly to get the key in the ignition. He turns the key, and as the engine roars to life, he looks back up to see someone run past his headlights into the darkness. He's taken aback for a split second, but immediately shrugs it off because Anne's neighborhood is filled to the brim with active walkers and joggers. Morning, noon, and night, someone is always going up and down those sidewalks. His phone rings, and Anne is the one on the other end, wanting to talk while he drives home like they usually do. Not the brightest idea, but they're kids. He drives through her neighborhood and out to the main road, both of them telling each other how much they love each other the whole time until he gets to the stop sign. A couple of cars pass, and he waits for his turn to make a left-hand turn when he sees two strange human-like creatures crawling on the house across the road. What the F? He shouts. Anne says, are you okay? You didn't crash, did you? Bo says, no, nothing like that. There's these weird things climbing on the roofs of some of the houses. And Anne says, what do you mean, like burglars? He says, I don't think so. They aren't wearing any clothes and they're extremely pale. Anne says, that's weird. Are you gonna call the cops? Bo says, yeah. I'll call you back in a sec. He hangs up the phone, taking a moment to take everything in before calling. He calls in an anonymous tip to the police and finally pulls out of the neighborhood. 
but instead of heading home, curiosity takes over and he drives across the street into the neighborhood where he spotted these things. Amazingly enough, as he's driving around, he can still see them crawling and hopping across buildings like nobody's business, tripping motion detector lights and causing people to come outside to check out the commotion. He follows them for a bit before finding himself in a Culver's parking lot, but being forced to actually follow the roads took him on a slightly circuitous route, so by the time he gets to the parking lot, he lost him, but wants to get out of the car, but he doesn't quite have the nerve for that. He's sitting in the lot, still looking for these creatures. His phone starts buzzing and vibrating on the dashboard, scaring the crap out of him. It's Ann. Did you get home okay? Bo confesses that he hasn't gone home yet, but is instead trying to follow these things. Ann says, are you crazy? Stop playing Fox Mulder and go home. He says, all right. Not telling her that he's pretty sure these are creatures not burglars, and turns his car around for home. The whole way back home, he feels like someone is watching him, but nothing happens. He pulls into the driveway, gets out of the car on surprisingly shaky legs, and walks to the front door. Now this is where it would be fitting for a crawler to be waiting for him at his door. But that's not what happens, at least not that night. A week goes by, and Bo pretty much forgets the whole thing, except at night. Now, he hates to admit it, but he's a little afraid of the dark anyway. So he assumes that the paranoia he's feeling is the usual paranoia he feels. That assumption continues each night until he ends up back in the same Culver's parking lot later that week to grab a bite to eat after staying late at a friend's house. He buys a few burgers, pulls into a parking spot, and starts to chow down while sitting on the hood of his car. He only plans to be there for a few minutes, so he leaves it running so he can listen to the radio. He is looking out at the dried up riverbed beyond the parking lot when he sees those same things crawling along the sand and heading toward the same neighborhood again. He freezes, just watching and taking in every detail. They are a light gray and almost completely hairless except for a weird line of what honestly looks like fur down the middle of their backs. They easily tower over him. Bo is six foot four, but these things nearly reach the shingles of the houses they are climbing onto. They look thin except their stomachs, which bulge out, making them look like they're pregnant. God, he hopes they're not pregnant. He watches three of them run across the road and climb onto the roofs of buildings and start moving in the direction of the more residential part of town. He puts down his food, hops off his car, and walks a fair distance over to the sidewalk to get a better look. After watching these things move, almost mesmerized by what he is seeing, he snaps back to his senses, realizes this is probably not the best idea he's ever had, and turns back around. As Bo heads back to the relative safety of the parking lot, he is bathed in the glow of the Culver sign as its neon hum drills into his head, the only sound that he hears. Wait a minute, what happened to the radio? He looks over at his car, and to his horror, two more of those things are at his car. One is at his hood, devouring his cheeseburgers, and the other is inside the car, digging around the front seats. He freezes and watches as the things eat his food and trash his car. His heart is pounding, but he doesn't know what to do. He looks over to the restaurant, but they were starting to close up when he got his food, so they're already gone. Bo is the only one in that parking lot. The best direction to run would be across the street, but he knows there's more of them over there too. He feels as if he's stuck between two terrible options in a horror film. His vision blurs and he starts to feel sick to his stomach just watching those things eat. He doesn't know why, 
but he takes a step forward and begins to walk toward his car. He doesn't feel in complete control of his body, but he is able to steer it. He gets himself over to the restaurant itself and now has a building between him and them. He leans out and peeks over at his car for close to 20 minutes, watching those things scurry around his vehicle until they finally make their way back across the street. Once he feels it's safe, Bo runs to his car, hops into the passenger seat, and slams the door shut. He crawls into the driver's seat, starts it up, and peels out of there. Now remember, the car's been running this whole time, so by now, it's running on fumes. He runs three red lights to get home in record time. His car sputters out before he makes it home, but he feels much safer at least having passed the sign into his neighborhood. He pushes the car into his driveway, cursing up a storm as his physical exhaustion now matches the level of his mental exhaustion. Bo pushes the car back into its parking spot and locks it up. He silently makes his way through the front yard, not wanting to wake his dad or his dogs, and walks around the house to the side yard where his front door is located. He looks across the patio and there, sitting on the wall separating his dad's yard from their neighbor's yard, is one of those things. Its back is turned to Bo, but he can still tell it's eating something. Not really giving a crap about what it's eating, Bo busts out his best ninja moves and keeps moving toward the door as stealthily as possible, being extra careful on the creaky steps. And despite one loud creak, the thing never turns away from its meal. Bo gets in, closes and locks the door, and crashes onto the couch where he falls asleep from exhaustion. Not to mention the fact that his bedroom is technically closer to the thing on the fence, so he'll just stay in the living room, thank you very much. The next day, his dad finds a dead cat in their yard and has the sad job of informing their family friend who lives nearby that their cat's been killed by a mountain lion or something. Bo hasn't seen the crawler since. He doesn't actually live on that side of town anymore, but to this day, he knows they are still out there in the heart of Tucson, living in the river washes and storm drains. They are the reason so many animals end up on missing pet flyers. They are the reason he doesn't walk around town at night and why he refuses to even let his pets go outside at night. Because he knows that once the sun goes down in Tucson, those things crawl out of their holes and hunt. When Sean was a kid, his dad worked as a golf course superintendent in a small town in southern Illinois. His story takes place in the early 90s, so the golf course's sprinkler system was not computerized like most of the systems are today. That meant on warm nights when the grass needed extra water, his dad had to go back to work, drive his golf cart out on the dark golf course, and manually turn every sprinkler on himself. Sean always begged to go with him. And one mid-September night after supper, his dad finally said yes. The night is warm as they roar out of the maintenance shop into the darkness and down the old gravel cart path. The golf cart has no headlights, so his dad has to steer based on his memory and the little they can see from the sliver of the moon left in the sky. It's a small town golf course located a little ways out of town, so instead of being surrounded by houses like most golf courses are today, it's bordered only by cornfields on one side and forest on the other. Sean's dad tells him he often hears coyotes yipping and howling at night and that they sometimes follow his golf cart in a large, silent pack, eyes glowing gold in the small flashlight beam. Knowing this, Sean is a bit scared when they stop at the first sprinkler control box. His dad leaves him in the cart to go turn it on, and Sean huddles close to his seat back and looks 
all around, trying to see any coyotes that might be stalking them. Sitting there in the dark, Sean suddenly remembers his dad telling him the story of finding a man who had ended himself in the bathroom on the ninth hole. He had found the man lying there on the cement floor in a pool of blood, his handgun lying by his side. The ninth hole is not that far away from where they are parked, and suddenly Sean is more afraid of ghosts than coyotes. It's after the third sprinkler stop when all the coyotes start howling in one big chorus. So loud, it sounds like they are right in front of them. Sean's dad keeps the cart moving, bouncing down a steep, uneven curve in the gravel path next to the deep woods. And he actually stops the cart to listen to them. As his dad sits quietly listening to the coyotes howl, Sean says, come on, dad, let's go back. His dad says, just hang on, bud. Sean squints into the darkness, trying to see if anything's moving. His dad turns on his flashlight and scans the tall prairie grass next to the woods, but there's nothing there. Suddenly, a loud crashing sound echoes in the brush to their right somewhere inside of the woods. Sean grabs his dad's arm. His dad says, don't worry. It's probably just a deer that the coyotes are hunting. He elbows Sean in the ribs and says, Coyotes like the taste of deer way more than they like the taste of little kids. But Sean is not fooled. He can see the fear in his dad's eyes. There's an old abandoned silo at the edge of the woods directly ahead of them. Sean's dad used to jokingly call it Dracula's Castle when he would take Sean and his other siblings out for daytime drives around the golf course. Sean remembers thinking it was so fun, especially when his dad would let them throw rocks at it and try to get them to go through the grain loading window at the top of the silo. The rocks would hit with a loud crack and bounce off the silo every time. Then his dad would do Dracula's voice, shouting, stop waking me up, you naughty children. And they would all laugh. On this night, however, coming up to the turn where the silo would appear, Sean isn't laughing at all. He is spooked by that large cement structure, dark and empty in the night air that is getting colder by the minute. Sean's dad stops the cart on the path and gets out to walk to the next control box. Sean asks, Hey dad, can I keep the flashlight? But his dad says, Sorry bud, I needed to see the sprinkler controls. But you can come with me if you want. But Sean refuses. He is not getting out of that cart, not when coyotes and ghosts are around. As his dad walks into the darkness, Sean turns to look at that old silo, the single black eye of its grain-loading window staring back at him in the faint moonlight. He thinks about what it would be like to live in a silo like that, its caved-in roof open to the wind and the rain. Suddenly, a pale face appears in the window. It's far enough away that Sean can't see much detail, but it's bald and has bright white skin, like Elmer's glue white. It has two black pinprick eyes, a nose that looks more like a black hole, and a gaping wide mouth, as if it's permanently, silently screaming. Sean can't move or speak as it looks directly at him from the top of the silo. He wants to call out to his dad to try to drive the cart over to him to get them both out of there, but all he can do is watch as it scrambles out of the hole like some lizard snake skeleton thing, slick and bony and terrifyingly flexible. It slides more than climbs down the silo's ladder and lands in the brush below, standing but hunched over and still staring at Sean. It has long, bony arms and legs that seem all jumbled with too many joints. Its eyes are so black that Sean wants to scream. Suddenly, a scream escapes Sean's lips, but it isn't his. It's the pack of coyotes howling in unison, a screaming sort of howl that he has never heard before and that sounds like a mixture of rage and fear. 
In a heartbeat, the white thing disappears, darting away in a flash of white and crashing into the brush behind the silo and the woods beyond. Sean's dad runs over to the cart, jumps in, and beelines it back to the maintenance shop, flying past the old bathroom on hole nine, so close that Sean can see what he thinks are bloodstains on the concrete next to the men's room door. Sean doesn't ask his dad what he heard or saw. Is he just unnerved by the coyote freakout? Or did he see the impossible white thing too? Sean does know that his dad is as freaked as he is because he doesn't bother with the rest of the sprinklers, doesn't stop to lock up the shop when they get back, abandons the cart outside and jumps into his work truck to speed them both home. Sean never goes back to that course at night and his dad always seems a little jumpy when he has to go set the sprinklers at night. And he knows his dad has started taking a pellet gun with him too and a much larger, more powerful flashlight. What was that thing that Sean saw? Did his fevered childhood imagination conjure it up? Was it somehow related to the most likely dead owners of that abandoned silo? Or the coyotes? Or the man who ended himself in the bathroom on the ninth hole? Sean will never know because he will never go back to find out. Bill lives on a pretty decently sized chunk of land with room enough for a garage a good 250 to 300 feet from the main house and the backyard backs up to some woods. They get quite a bit of wildlife there, so one of their favorite things to do is to set chicken livers outside below the windows so they can watch the foxes come close to the house and eat them. But back to the bonfire. Bill and Chris invite a couple of friends and proceed to spend the evening drinking beer and talking smack. Out of nowhere, Bill has the grand idea to take the rest of the chicken livers and put them behind the detached garage in the woods. There's a game camera back there, so the plan is to put the livers in front of the camera to see whatever animals are lurking deeper in the woods. So Bill grabs the livers, grabs Chris, and they go back down the 300-foot driveway to the back of the garage. It's about 11 o'clock at night, so they have their phone flashlights on to light the way. They get down behind the garage, and Bill hears something walking in the woods. And he tells Chris, shh, shut up, listen. Chris says, I don't hear anything. They take a few more steps, and now Chris hears it too. They stop again and listen, and there's nothing. They're about 10 or 15 feet away from the tree line, and Bill takes one step, sees movement off to his right slightly, and shines his phone light over there. There is a white face looking at them from behind a fallen tree. But evidently, he has had a few too many Miller lights because it doesn't even register in his brain and he moves his light away. They can both hear it running back and forth in front of them within the tree line. It's so fast that they can only catch fleeting glimpses of whatever this thing is. But what they can see is something moving oddly, kind of jerky and stilted, but yet graceful for its height and its speed. They are panicking, trying to get their lights on it. And after about 10 seconds of this, both their lights hit it and it stops dead in its tracks. It's somewhere between six and seven feet tall, super skinny. They can see its tendons in its arms and legs, super long arms that come well past its knees. Obviously long legs as well. It's running on two feet and stops in a weird position, not really facing them, but it has its head turned toward them. It doesn't really have any facial features, nothing in its eye sockets. Their phone lights reflect off its pale skin. It seems like they sit there staring at each other for minutes. Bill eventually screams, takes off, and leaves Chris behind. Chris eventually follows suit and starts running as well. Of course, as Bill is running, he trips and falls. But as he's lying there, he stops moving and just sits there, listening. He doesn't hear anything, so he thinks they're in the clear. 
He gets back up and the pair start running again. As they're running back up the driveway toward the house, Chris says, I think it's pacing us. Bill has no idea what it is and thinks maybe he's gone nuts until they get back to the house and stop. Chris reads his face and says, Nah, man, I saw it too. Just can't get enough of the unknown? Click here for more terrifying tales from the shadows. Be careful out there, and we will see you here again on The In Between. Bye.